expanding to platforms outside of the regular platforms that everyone knows about and lowering your reliance on any one platform. Most people are reliant on Amazon. That accounts for probably 90% of most of the businesses out there. And the goal that we try is to have only 50% reliance on any one platform. And all the rest of the platforms should be the other 50%. So that if one platform disappears, even if it's the biggest one, you still have a good 50% of your business left that's still coming in. So you don't necessarily lose the business because that one platform shut down, but will transfer to the other platforms. Today, I have Rick Mursky. He is the founder and CEO of Ecom Diversify. So that is going to be what we're going to be covering today is diversification, which I know is a super <laughs> hot topic in any ecom community, but especially in the Amazon community. How should you diversify? Where should you diversify? What does that look like? I'm so excited to have Rick on thank you. today to help you get insights on this. Again, thank Absolutely. you for being on. I'd love for you to tell a little bit about yourself, maybe a brief backstory on how you even got into <laughs> what you're doing right now. Sure. So my name is Rick Mercy, and my company was founded with the purpose of helping brands figure out where else they can sell their products besides Amazon, eBay, Walmart, mm -hmm. and all of those. Now, we started this because I had been working for a few different brand uh, brand name companies. And, you know, we were selling very well on those marketplaces. And then one day we got suspended on one of those marketplaces and we lost a very large portion of the business for a very long period of time. And so we all had a meeting together and we said, what can we do to make sure this doesn't happen again? And aside from all the operational stuff and figuring out what it was and keeping it from happening again on that side, we realized that there's probably other places that we can sell the products that we were selling. And what was the process like to make that happen? So we started researching it. Myself, I started researching it. And within about a year, we were selling in five other retail sites and a few other marketplaces as well. So that kind of put the light bulb over my head, like, oh, wow, this is actually a real thing. People can sell, I don't want to say anywhere they want, but people can sell in more places. And so I started branching out more for this company that I was working for. And then around COVID time, I realized you know, there's probably a lot of other companies that need this help too. Why am I just tying myself down to one company? Let's see if we can do it for multiple companies at the same time. So I worked with a small focus group to figure out if it was worthwhile, and it seemed it was, and the rest is history, as they say. Definitely. I found that's where a lot of people grow. Like when you have a unique service like you, it's like it grew out of, I need this because you encountered some issues with a platform getting shut down, major impact on the business, and then... At some point, once you get your head above water, you look around and go, oh, I could probably help others out with this skill. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's start with what is diversification? I'm sure the audience probably has an idea, but maybe you in the space could help us define what it looks like. So in the type of scenario that we're talking about, diversification is, like I mentioned before, expanding to platforms outside of the regular platforms that everyone knows about and lowering your reliance on any one platform. Most people are reliant on, we'll say it, Amazon. That accounts for probably 90% of most of the businesses out there. And the goal that we try and help our clients get to is to have at only 50% reliance on any one platform. And all the rest of the platforms should be the other 50%. So that if one platform disappears, even if it's the biggest one, you still have a good 50% of your business left that's still coming in. And the old adage applies, right? Everyone has to buy the product somewhere. So it's not available in one place, but it's available in four other places. You may get those people who would have bought it in the first place buying it on the new platforms that are that's still available on. So you don't necessarily lose the business because that one platform shut down. You may lose some of it, but some of it will transfer to the other platforms as well. Yeah, losing 50 versus 90. That's huge. Big difference. Big difference. Yep. So it sounds like it's not just a diversification as far as selling platforms. It's also a diversification of risk. Yes, absolutely. Cool. So when you were saying other markets outside of like the typical Amazon, I'm sure there's a lot of Amazon sellers listening in. How many other markets are there? There's a lot. And it's expanding every day. There's a couple of companies out there, one of which is called Miracle. And they built a very interesting platform that allows retailers to put a full service marketplace on their existing retail site. So think of a company like Bed Bath & Beyond, right? So they've been selling on their website for many years and you can be a vendor, you can sell them product wholesale and they'll sell it on their site. You can also be a dropship vendor where they'll send you orders and you fulfill those orders for their customers. But now there's also their marketplace option because of this company Miracle, where they were able to just seamlessly integrate a marketplace platform where you can sell your product on Bed Bath & Beyond, not sell it to Bed Bath & Beyond. And you can continue to sell like that versus having to sell at a wholesale retail relationship. 
So Miracle built this platform and it's been utilized by a number of retailers. I can't even begin to mention all of them here, but because of companies like that, there's been a, an influx of all new marketplaces that are existing now that weren't around two years ago. That is really cool. So would you say that Miracle's like a unified platform to you? Like on the consumer end, you would appear on multiple sites, but on the back end for the seller, it's almost like one unified place? No, not exactly. No. They are all individually operated by their brands, by their retailers, but it kind of gives you a back end for potentially connecting to all of those retailers, mm -hmm. right? So Miracle has a platform that you would sign up for, or we would sign you up for, and then you can reach out to different retailers and marketplaces through that platform. There's an idea of a, a unified location where we can ask to be a part of different marketplaces, right? But mm -hmm. when you do that, you sometimes will reach the lowest person on the totem pole in that marketplace. So it does still help to have someone on your side who can reach the right people at that yeah. platform, regardless of whether we have that connection platform. That sounds awesome. And it's definitely something that I would love to dig into in a little bit later. But I would also like to cover what should a brand have in place before you diversify? Because I imagine with all the different marketplaces, potential to spread yourself thin. How does one know you're ready? So a couple of things. The first thing is it's extremely important to have a software available to you for managing your inventory and managing your orders. Because when you think about it, you know, when you're selling on Amazon, you've got Seller Central, and that kind of gives you everything that you need to have your inventory, have your orders, and all of that. But now you start adding four, five, six, seven, ten other platforms, and orders are flowing in from all of those platforms. Now, if you don't have a unified software available that can help you, you, what you end up having to do is logging into this one and pulling down orders from here, and then logging into this one and pulling out orders from here, and logging into this one, and then updating all those orders back the other way. And it can become a time-consuming mess to get that done properly. So I definitely recommend having a software in place that can unify that together. In terms of what you should have in your infrastructure, you need to have a team available to you that can not just operate the marketplace and the, or the retail or whatever it is that you're working in, the platform, but it should also be able to optimize what's going on, have a, a solid understanding of each one and be able to really get into depth on each one. If you have one person who's monitoring your entirety of your e-commerce life, that one person will never be able to handle everything that's going on in all of these platforms. So it's important to have a team available that can learn and handle on the fly all these different issues that will come up from these different marketplaces. That is a really great point. I imagine with the other marketplaces, it's similar to Amazon, that you don't want to run out of stock. Yeah, you never want to run out of stock. Look, you understand this year we're in a particular situation. Now people are overstocked. Last year people were understocked. There, there's an understanding there. Probably even more of an understanding than Amazon has, right? Amazon has no understanding if you go out of stock. It's just you're out of stock, you're done. But there's a little bit more understanding because you're dealing with real people, right? That there's a merchant that you're dealing with. There's a buyer that you're dealing with. There's a representative from the company who's working with you and who understands what your situations that you're going through is. Now at the same time, they don't want you to go out of stock every five minutes. You don't want to have stock today and then tomorrow you're out of stock and then three days later, oh, you're back in, but you're out again in a month. You have to make some form of consistency to make them happy and make them willing to continue selling your products. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, you don't want to screw up your relationships. Yeah, these retailers and marketplaces, they're always rationalizing what they have on their shelves, even their digital shelves. They don't want to continue to hold product on shelf that is not going to be in stock. They don't want to devote a location for you, even if it's a virtual location, if the product is not going to be sellable. Absolutely. So in addition to having just the baseline logistics in place, what would you say a lot of these platforms are looking for when it comes to determining if you should be on their digital shelf? The number one thing they're looking for is differentiation, right? They want to see what's different about your product from the other product that we already have on site. It's great to sell a light bulb, right? A standard, regular A19 style light bulb that you put into any lamp or any light fixture, right? It's great to sell that, but there's also 17,000 other people who are selling that. And to walk up to, let's say, Lowe's, for example, and say, hey, I've got this great A19 bulb and I want to sell it on your shelf. It's kind of like, why do we need you? So you want to have something a little different. Oh, maybe your bulb is a higher wattage than other bulbs, or maybe your bulb has different colors that uh, than other bulbs have that we don't have on our site. That's something that would make a retailer interested in bringing. Yeah. 
I think that makes a lot of sense. So you're saying if you're selling on Amazon and you have like your crap products that aren't doing well, those are probably not the ones to leave. Yeah, with. probably not. Probably not. No retailer wants to be the company that we're selling our overstock product to. Even overstock.com, by the way, doesn't want to be the overstock. Product. So in that case, if you have a solid brand, does that give you the leg up? When it comes to maybe getting some space on additional... There's a difference between a solid brand and a solid brand name, right? A solid brand just means that your brand is selling well somewhere. Now, a brand that's selling well somewhere, let's say on Amazon or eBay or Walmart, doesn't necessarily mean that those sales are going to translate to a retailer. I have people who come to me all the time. They tell me, hey, I really want to sell on Home Depot, right? And I look at their product and I tell them, no, this isn't really going to work because it's not different than what's already on site. And they tell me, what do you mean? I'm selling 7,000 pieces a month on Amazon. I'm doing so well. How could Home Depot not want me? Because they don't. It's not what they want on their site. Just because you're selling well in one place doesn't mean that's going to translate everywhere else. And they know that. They understand what they're looking for. Don't try and teach them what they're looking for. I think that is a great segue into my next question of sure. knowing where you fit. So when it comes to diversification, you're saying there's all these additional marketplaces you can get into. How do you choose the marketplace that would be best for, say, your brand? I'd like to say you come to me and ask me and I'll help you. But failing that, there is an experiential feel to it, right? It's easy for a brand owner who's selling really well somewhere, like I mentioned before, to say, oh, I can sell everywhere and my product would be great for this retailer because they don't have it on their site, but maybe they don't want it on there. That's why there is a level of experience that's important. And that's why I do recommend that people come to us and ask us, here's my product. Where do you think I would fit? I'll definitely help you with that. That's one of the main things that we do. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Because like you said, the marketplace owners definitely know their marketplace. They know their holes in the marketplace. And they also, I assume, have really good insights on the analytics of who their shopper is. So it's Correct. Like they're looking for products that are going to serve their shopper base, which might not be what the shopper base you have on Amazon is. Correct. Correct. And Amazon is just a different animal than all other sites out there, at least today. And just because you're selling, you're selling really well with your disposable cups doesn't mean that the target wants you to dispose. Got it. So I was going to ask, but it might just be the it's depends question on if you think that there's like kind of an easy first step marketplace to get into for Amazon sellers, or is there even? If you're on Amazon and you're not on Walmart yet, I think that's a big mistake. There is something to be said for my item is not really a Walmart item. The only time I would say that is if you're selling a high priced luxury item, that might not be a Walmart type of deal. And it might still sell well on Amazon. But outside of Amazon, eBay, and Walmart, there really is no next best place depending on what your product line is. Right now, the hot marketplace is Target. Everyone wants to get into Target Plus. We can help with that, by the way. They have strict requirements also. They have their priorities that they're looking to fill. And if you don't fill one of those priorities, then they're not interested. So there's no, it's not cut and dry. It's not a, an easy answer. It really relies on show me what you got. I'll tell you where you fit and work. Yeah. I mean, that sounds good. So then the next part of that, I think would be, okay, so moving into the other marketplace, I assume there's additional costs that are involved in moving into another yeah. channel. Um, yeah. Not only excess inventory, but like Amazon has Amazon fees. So how would you say, I'm sure this is, again, an it depends question, but Roughly speaking, is there like an average cost associated with moving into another channel? A day or two ago, I would have told you the average cost is going to be approximately 10% of your cost to the channel. And now that could be, that, that's something that we have to define here, right? What do we mean when we say cost to the channel? When you're, there's two different, there's two different structures that these sites can have, right? They can have a marketplace structure or they can have a retail structure. What's a marketplace structure? A marketplace structure is you, you're selling your product on their site and you're paying a commission of your sale to them, similar to Amazon, right? You have a 13%, 14%, whatever it is that you're in your category. And that's what you pay them on each sale out of the retail price, okay? Now, there's also the retail structure. The retail structure is you pay, you, you offer the product to the site at a wholesale cost right? They list that product at a retail cost. When they, when they get an order for your product, you ship that product and they pay you the wholesale cost and they pocket the difference between the wholesale and the retail. Now, most of these retailers will also take an additional percentage off of the wholesale cost when you invoice them. 
right? So that's another additional amount of money that goes into their pocket. So I would say, I would have said typically 10%, but about a day or two ago, I started working with another platform that takes 19% off of the wholesale cost. So I'm sure a few people out there who are watching know exactly which platform I'm talking about. So I can't really answer the way I normally would have, but it is generally in that range. That's a, at least that gives a good ballpark for people like, yeah. on Diversify. And I assume there's also like with Amazon, when you set up your account and you put up the listings, like there's all the costs involved with getting assets in place, making cool. sure your digital self looks good. So how that would be another question. This is off the cuff. Mm -hmm. When sure. it comes to selling on different marketplaces, how easy is it or should you even any images digital assets you have for each product how easy is it to carry that over into the other marketplaces it's not easy at all um no it's not there's a lot of companies out there who claim to provide a one-stop solution for syndicating product data and information to retailers and marketplaces the reality of that is it's not easy. It's great to have a PIM software or DAM software where you keep all of your product information and digital assets together in one place, but there's no software out there that you can press one button and syndicate it everywhere that you want to go. It just doesn't exist. So what does that mean for you? That means that either you need to have a team in place that already ha already understands how to do that, what the different requirements are of each of each channel, or to work with a company like mine that has the experience and can help you to do that without you needing to lift a finger to get it done. And you may need to lift a finger here or there to answer some additional questions that we may have, but we have that experience level. We have that expertise that we can uh, easily syndicate the information from wherever you have it now, whether it's a PIM, a DAM, or Amazon, or whatever it is, to the other retailers and marketplaces that you're going to want to work with. And I imagine very similar to how you want to have Amazon listings very specific to the requirements of the Amazon platform, not just so you are allowed to showcase the products, but then also to speak mm -hmm. to whatever the Amazon consumer is very used to. And then setting up Walmart listings has different nuances depending on how the Walmart customer behaves. I imagine it would be something very similar across all the other marketplaces as well. Absolutely. We call it full enrichment, right? You want to have all your pages, your product information pages, whether you call them PIPs or whether you call them PDMs, whatever you call them, they have to be fully enriched. They have to be, you want to have them, a lot of these sites, you have this meter as you're filling out the information that goes from 0% to 100%. And maybe at 80%, you're allowed to show the product, but it's not quite 100% yet. But you want to make sure you get to 100% on all these platforms. And if you need help to get there, then it, there's nothing wrong with asking for help. That that's a really great point. And then, so then my next question would be, as getting all the additional listings up, it, that requires time and effort. Do you recommend starting with a smaller subsection of your catalog, given the time and effort requirements, or do you recommend like broadening out a little bit more if you have a large catalog? I'm going to let you answer that question because you know the answer, right? The answer is it depends, <laughs> right? <laughs> it depends on the platform, right? There are some platforms where. Um, Starting with less is more, right? Because they want to see how things go before they let you in with your full catalog. That's more going to be on the retail side. But then there are also the marketplaces where more is more, right? Where if you try to give them less, they look at it and they go, oh, this is a small catalog. We don't want that. We're not interested. But give us 10,000 pieces and whoa, we're really happy. So it really does depend on the platform. Again, I can give insight to anyone who's interested in, in, in that particular question based on their particular case. Yeah. Again, it depends, but it sounds like it always depends. knowing the platform that you're looking to get into is yes. what you need. Yeah. Yes. And if you don't know the platform that you're looking to get into, just contact me and I will help you. So then next, so after you're, okay, so I know the platform, I know where I'm going, I know what's involved. What does the timeline look like on moving into another platform? Again, it depends. It's all the platform. The plat Each platform has their own nuances and their own, you know, how backed up they are. Uh, there are some platforms like, for example, Target, I can mention this Target is very backed up. There's a lot of people who are looking to get into Target and it takes a while. You may find that they, you go two, three months without getting a response. You may find that you get a, yes, we want you in, into on our marketplace. And then 
you don't get a contract for another month. These things happen. You have to not get worried. It's good to have someone who can check in on it for you to make sure that the process is still moving. But it's definitely not something that you need to get worried about if it takes longer than you may think. There's, But I don't want to say that so cut and dry because if you apply on your own and you don't get a response, that is a red flag. Something's up there. Maybe you weren't accepted. Maybe they don't want you. Maybe they didn't even look at your application yet, which happens all the time. So it helps to have, as I keep saying, it helps to have someone on your side who can just simply ping the right people and say, hey, let's get this taken. Let's get this looked at. Let's make sure it gets in front of someone. I started, one of the main reasons why I started this business is because there's a lot of retailers out there who put an application on their site and say, hey, just fill this out and we'll get back to you. But they don't get back to you because they're not looking at that. They don't really want to look at that. It's just like their bucket for, I'm bored today. I need to, I need to find something to do. Let me look through a few of the applications in that bucket. But there's thousands of applications in there and they're looking at three every six months. What's the point? So having a team that can actually get the right people and put it directly in front of them and say, hey, take a look at this guy. This guy's important. I think he's great. That helps to move things along. Yeah, definitely. And even that, I would imagine just knowing what the different platforms are looking for and being able to mm -hmm. speak to that when you're bringing a brand, definitely, I'm sure, helps people make a easy. It's easier for them to make a decision that you're right in their platform. Absolutely. Cool. And then I guess my last question, and this is just because I come from an ad side, would be, mm. okay, so you're on the platform, right? But as a lot of sellers know, when you get on Amazon, that's not, it doesn't mean, okay, I'm on Amazon, like case closed. It's you have to get found. You have to get seen on the platforms. And I'm sure it's another, it depends on the platform question. <laughs> But once you're on the platform, how do you get your products like found? Is it on platform ads? Do you recommend running like off platform ads? What does that process look like? Okay. So it does depend, but it depends on whether or not the platform has an advertising module available. Not all platforms do. Some platforms, just the sheer amount of organic search that's happening for these platforms is enough to drive sales in some way, shape, or form. Offsite ads are always going to help. Running Google ads, running running Facebook ads, if you can afford to do it, it can help. You have to remember that these sites themselves are running their own Facebook ads and their own Google ads at all times. So that's already helping. The ones that do have on-site advertising, some of it is great, some of it is not. It also depends on the category that you're in. Some categories need it, some categories don't. So it isn't, it's it isn't, it depends question. It's not the same as Amazon, where if you're not doing ads, you're not making any money. But there, there is also a level of involvement in your in your accounts, right? If you look at a retailer or one of these marketplaces as a set it and forget it location for selling products, you're not going to do well. But if you're involved and you're talking to your merchant, your buyer, and you're saying, what can we do to make things better? Oh, you want me to run an ad campaign? Sure, I'll run an ad campaign. What do you think we should put in? Okay, getting showing that you're involved shows that you care. And because you're dealing with real people, and we all know it helps to feel cared about. So if you don't feel cared about, you're just not going to help the people who need it and it helps to be involved and to show them that you care about your your account. Definitely. This has been fantastic. I really Thank appreciate you. you coming on. I've learned Absolutely. so much myself, and I know diversification <laughs> is on everyone's mind these days, diversifying platforms as well as diversifying risk. And from everything Definitely. you talked about, it sounds like these things take time. So I assume best to start ASAP if you have the That's infrastructure right. in place. For people who are saying, okay, this sounds like a lot. I would love someone to help me out with this. Um, That's right. Please let everyone know where they can find you. So you can find us either w.ecomdiversified.com. You can email myself, rick at ecomdiversified.com, and we can help you quickly. I would like to say that Q4 is a great time to start. I know all the sellers who are uh, look who are listening to this right now are likely busy because it is Q4, but now's the right time because the buyers are busy too, which means that if we start together and we get things set up and ready to go, by the time Q1 hits when they're really open and ready to talk, we can get you right in. Awesome. Yeah. And we will definitely put all that contact information in the description. And as always, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.